I'm Rob. And we're from Dorset Council, so we're just going to do a quick presentation for also at Dorset Council, and that's not right on here, but anyway, we'll just ignore that. Um, so first, a little more background about our team. Um, so the councils came together in 2019, same as BCP, when we became unitary and the uh, districts and ourselves joined together. Um, our GIS team uh, is formed of three key areas, really, those being the sort of spatial uh, data side, um, the addressing and properties and then our web development area and myself uh, Rob and Lucy at the back are the web development arm of that team um, that. so um, our experience um, has shown us that uh, we, we sometimes are a little bit different to some of the other sort of um, local authority GIS teams uh, we like to think in a good way we'll let you decide what you think oh, go away sorry computer now wants to do updates I knew that was going to, I knew that was going to do that. Uh, which one is it? Which one is it? Where's our one? Yes. Maybe. There we go. Hey, technology is not being my friend today. Um, so our, our focus is not so much on the doing. We don't actually do that much sort of day to day GIS sometimes in terms of actually sort of plotting and, and creating maps. But it's much more based about around building applications and solutions for um, the people that work at Dorset Council uh, to allow them to self-serve and, uh, and to do that themselves as much as possible. And as it says at the bottom there, we, that includes web applications we build and also um, QGIS plugins. Um, so a couple of years ago, I did a presentation on um, the work I was doing to try and help move some of our users from proprietary GIS solutions to QGIS because that was something that the council identified as a priority. And this presentation, in a way, is kind of an update um, following on from that. And uh, what we really wanted to do was just uh, focus a bit on some of the challenges that COVID threw at us, um, you know, some of the things that happened uh, as a result of that pandemic um, and also give you a bit of an update on where we got to with our um, QGIS work, some of the things we found we thought might be useful for others that may be also discovering the same sorts of things. And um, particularly we wanted to introduce um, a, a new idea of ours, which is to release one of our web applications as an open source application. And that's kind of our first go at telling anyone that we're gonna do that and showing you where we're at. So it's a brand new thing. Uh, we're keeping it just to this room for now so we can get your feedback on that and you can tell us what you think uh, and then uh, after the event, uh, depending on whether or not you'll say it's a terrible idea or not, we might publish that out for the rest of the stay kind people. Us, yes, we are being, we're going to stay very kind. And so on that, I'm going to pass over to Rob now. He's going to give you a little bit more background on, on how we got to where we are with um, our sort of GIS infrastructure. Thank you. Um, so... We go back about 15 years. Um, the GIS landscape, as you probably will all remember, was very, very different. Um, so QGIS was only a couple of years old. Um, it was still called Quantum GIS, I believe. Um, web mapping itself was still pretty basic. Um, and certainly in the council, I'm sure in a lot of other places, we we're still using the likes of Windows XP. You know, remember those dark days. Um, so at Dorset Gantt Council, we used MapInfo pretty much exclusively for our desktop users, um, just tab files on a file share, nothing fancy. Um, we did have our own in-house built web mapping application, um, which we called Dorset Explorer. Um, this was built with MapInfo's Map Extreme engine, if anyone remembers that, classic ASP, and it even had a Microsoft Access database behind the scenes, so pretty, pretty gnarly. Um, if we go forward a little bit to about 10 years ago, um, we started making our first sort of tentative steps into it. Very, very tentative. Um, councils tend to move fairly slowly. We don't tend to be up with the um, So we still largely have a map info desktop user base, um, but we were starting to look at QGIS as sort of an option, maybe, uh, but mostly still map info. We updated our web mapping application, getting rid of our horrible access database. Um, so it was a bit more modern. It was built on Microsoft.NET framework. Um, it made use of GeoServer and open layers. Uh, but behind the scenes, we did still have an Oracle spatial database. That's where all our spatial data came. Um, Oracle spatial is very, very good, but it's certainly not open source and it certainly is not cheap. Um, but at the time, our options are pretty much SQL Server, not very good spatially, and Oracle, very good spatially, pretty expensive. Um, yeah, so 
Oh yeah, with the um, with the GS server, we use that in a very very basic way. So it's pretty much just a WMS service, nothing nothing fancy going on. We didn't really use their vector capabilities, their catalog metadata, any of that. It was a very very basic system. Moving forward to sort of now and the near future, um, you see this little open source column filled up quite nicely. Um, so QGIS is now kind of our, our default. Um, MapInfo is very much the exception rather than the rule. Um, there's still, we still have MapInfo licenses. There are people that need to use MapInfo because they've got a particular plugin um, or they've got sort of particular processes and we haven't really got around to converting them yet. But QGIS is now the default, and we every year our map info licenses have been going down and down and down. Um, our spatial data warehouse, so that was that Oracle database I was talking about, that's now being moved into Postgres. Uh, this is quite a long process. Um, the very, very big database, our Oracle spatial database. Um, I had to ask our database admin for some stats. She said, we've, we've got a single 1.5 terabyte monolith database. Um, which we're going to be breaking down into, I think, about 100 smaller individual Postgres databases. Um, this will consist of around 14,000 tables and over 1,000 views. So there's, a, there's a hell of a lot of data in there, so that's very much an ongoing process. Um, we're also, as we touched on just a minute ago, we're going to be rebuilding our in-house split mapping application um, to make use more use of open source and to make it open source itself and making more use of the GSL functionalities, the latest versions of open layers, and the latest version of Microsoft's open source.net. But we will cover a bit more on that later. I'll hand you back to Paul to talk about the QGIS migration. So I get the fun stuff, um, and Rob gets the uh, innovative stuff at the end there. But there we go. So yeah, so just getting back to QGIS then. So this is a little diversion into what the pandemic did to us. Um, I'm sure you've all got your own uh, <laughs> stories <laughs> but yeah so basically um, the pandemic definitely slowed us down so a lot of the work that we were doing trying to go around to talk to teams about why they might want to move over to say QGIS or whether or not they you know all those sorts of discussions stopped overnight um, everyone started remote working um, we had to help with the uh, the response on that um, but we did make some discoveries and as I'm sure most of you did, those discoveries tended to be around performance. So trying to get GIS to work from home, um, we found out that super fast isn't necessarily super fast. Your idea of super fast is not the same as my super fast. You know, whether or not someone happens to have gone down the road and pulled the cable out, uh, it, uh, which is a common excuse actually when conferences don't work. I'm amazed how often they're digging outside conference venues. But uh, we found it wasn't the same, and we spent a lot of time trying to work that out. We looked at, should we run it on a server? Because that way you get better access to the network drives. But there are problems with that. There's costs associated with having someone on a server. Um, and, and to be honest with you, we didn't really come to any particularly good uh, conclusions. At the moment, our working hypothesis is to try and keep it on the device. It makes more use of the device's resources and to try and just overcome some of those, um, those issues with network lag. And, and things like that. Um, so we had we had some some lovely discoveries that we made. Um, uh, but despite all of that, as Rob said earlier, um, we continue to migrate people over. Uh, all of our planners have now migrated over to use QGIS, um, largely due to a plugin and a, a third party supplier that they're using for their main planning system. But they have migrated over, and uh, many of our colleagues are switching over to using QGIS and beginning to discover some of the power that that has uh, and that can offer. So in terms of um, getting people to adopt it, um, this, uh, some of these will sort of cross over a bit with what Andrew was saying earlier. So we, um, we, we decided that we wanted to create our own plugin. Um, so we, had the, uh, we did look at the discovery one, but we decided that for now we wanted to use our own address, data, uh, address search, partly because we were in Oracle and we still are at the moment, as we were saying. Um, so the discovery one, I think, tends to be more PG uh, um, Postgres based. I was going with that. Um, and also because we wanted to put things like uh, the ability to count, uh, calculate a property footprint in from master map and um, bring the geocoding functionality a bit closer to the users. Um, we also wanted a particular look and feel to the way that the data discovery works. And I know that um, we've got a talk on GeoNode later, so that's another way that you can get data revealed to people within QGIS, but we wanted um, to have the look and feel, so we, we made our own plugin for that. 
Um, again, the planners wanted to be able to pick straight from master map, click, 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 merge and create a property outline. So we made some tools for them to do that. Um, and whenever it got a little bit complicated, we've been sort of generating scripts uh, for our users, obviously, and sticking them into the processing toolbox. Um, and that actually comes on later to some of the places where we discover bugs in QGIS. I'll get onto that. This one definitely does cover the same sort of thing that Andrew mentioned. So we had problems with some users being like, wow, this is great, but what, what, what am I supposed to do with all these tools? Too much, can't understand it at all. Um, and someone, uh, I think after that QGIS user group, put me in my place about the fact that the way I was deploying, it was completely mad. So we also discovered the INI files and the various different ways that you can help to configure it better when deploying it. So we created a kind of smaller, bigger buttoned version for our users. One of its biggest downsides though, um, I'm not a massive fan of them, but a lot of applications have ribbons and we have still, if anyone's worked out how to do a ribbon in QGIS, I'd love to know because as much as I may hate them, they are a good way of giving people lots of tools, but having that home tab where you can just put the sort of basics. Um, at the moment, we don't think we can do that in QGIS, so I'd love to know if someone's worked out how to do that. Um, so we discovered some bugs and we discovered that Windows is, a, is, is both lovely, but maybe not our friend sometimes in open source. A lot of the things are developed not on Windows. And uh, one of the ones that we discovered is uh, a bug with the QT library we've discovered which just makes it disappear. So our users are just working along, they click a button, bang, it's just gone. So as you can imagine, this has been a bit of a problem with our rollout of QGIS because people have been like, this application crashes. I think it is probably linked, uh, that particular one was linked to one of my scripts, but we were able to identify that it was to do with the QT library. Um, we did that by getting a commercial support contract, which to be fair was no small feat in local government at the moment with um, cuts, cuts, cuts everywhere. But we did. Um, we struggled to find um, support contracts that covered the range of open applications and proprietary applications that we use, though, uh, because at the moment, as you probably saw from that slide, we've still got Oracle, we've got Postgres, we've got GeoServer, we were looking at Geo Network, we had QGIS, we had MapInfo, we have quite a lot of different things going on at the moment. Um, and it allowed us to basically raise the bug reports to work out what was causing it and to raise that with the central forums. But what we weren't able to do was fund any fixes for it or push it any further. And they largely got closed. I think actually it may have stopped doing it as much. So it may have been fixed, but because we were looking at a, a, an open community, of course, we have absolutely no power over that. So we were unable to influence it from our position. We thought, can we fix it ourselves? Uh, but this bit's a, lo a little honest bit I wanted to put in there. We struggled a bit getting into the uh, open development. So if you take the big ones, and I think um, Tim's talk earlier kind of said a bit about it as well. We found that it's quite a learning curve. We tend to develop on Windows. We've got .NET. We're not really doing other things like that. So we, we struggled a bit um, getting um, ourselves up, skilled up in order to be able to use Git repositories and just to navigate all of the different things that were required to actually build these applications. And so what we've done is we've, um, we've pretty much just focused on our internal application and can we make this one open source because it's a .NET application, we're familiar with it and we wanted to share that back with the community and we're hoping that as we go through that journey that will help us to be able to develop on some of the bigger projects as well and, and get it right, get the right commit statements and all the things that you get um, interesting comments for if you get wrong. Um, so I think this is where I hand back to Rob now, who's going to just introduce GI Framework Maps. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we've, we've mentioned this thing called GI Framework Maps uh, very briefly. I just want to talk about what it actually is, uh, what we're doing and why. Um, so simply put, GI Framework Maps is just a, a web map. It's a web mapping application. Uh, allows staff and members of the public to view and interrogate spatial information. Your standard web mapping stuff. Um, it's essentially the fourth major iteration of our own system called Dorset Explorer, which I mentioned. So now we've got one, two, three, four. Um, so it's our fourth version that we've been sort of building on for over 15 years now. Um, Dorset Explorer itself has been very popular with our staff and with members of the public uh, in Dorset. Uh, last year, it racked up 2.7 million page views. Um, but the current iteration, which is that one in the middle there, um, is starting to creak a little bit. Um, it's a bit old. So we thought, well, now's the time to redevelop and why not also do it open source? 
for better or for worse. Um, so your first question, which I imagine a lot of people are going to be thinking of, why not use something that's already out there? There's a ton of projects out there doing very similar things. Uh, you just jump on the OSGO website, do the little project paper, you'll find a ton of things like this. Um, and that's a question we asked ourselves. Um, there's, a, there's good reasons why these are here as OSGO projects. So why are we doing our own thing? Um, we, there was a couple of reasons. So firstly, we're in a very fortunate position where we have our existing user base that I mentioned. They're very happy with what we've done. They they know the look and feel of what we've got. They know how it works. To just burn all that down and stick something new up, um, which is completely different from what they used to, we're going to burn a lot of goodwill within our user base. We don't really want to do that. Secondly, we've sort of touched on this a little bit already. We're not Java or PHP developers. We'd want to build upon it and do our own thing with it. Um, but with a lot of these, most of them are Java or PHP based behind the scenes. We don't know that. We're a .NET house, we're a Microsoft house. We're here to build that sort of stuff. Um, so in line with that, we actually saw this as quite a good opportunity to build a Microsoft.NET based alternative. So that if the other people are in a similar situation to us, there's something out there. Um, yeah, historically the open source community, looking at a lot of you out here, um, <laughs> has sort of been quite adverse to anything Microsoft based for very good reason. They don't have a great track record in the past of open source. Um, but yeah, in the past few years, the .NET ecosystem has really embraced open source and it itself is open source. Um, so yeah, we saw this as a good opportunity to kind of prove it. Uh, the fourth point I put there is just simply learning how to do this kind of stuff so we can actually contribute back a bit more as well as doing our own thing. Um, I put a little uh, quote at the bottom there from the Government Digital Service, um, which says this is kind of the reason why we want to do it this way. So we're a public service. Public services are built with public money. You and I give that. So unless there's a good reason not to do so, the code that they're based on should be made available for people to reuse and build on. I think that's a really nice quote and yeah, we're taking your money. If we build stuff, you should be able to use it. Other people should be able to use it as well. I lost my piece of paper for this one. <laughs> it's a pretty simple one though. This is kind of our timeline of what, what we're doing. So right now we're just finishing the main bulk of the development of that application. Around sort of Christmas time, we're looking to go to a sort of public beta. So we've done sort of internal betas with just our staff. Um, it's got some good feedback. So we just want to build on that, get to a public beta. It'll be pushed into a sort of private Git repository, so on GitHub. Um, we want to keep it private, first of all, because this is our first one. We want to make sure we've crossed all the I's and crossed all the T's and dotted the I's. Um, but yeah, if anyone does want to have a look, we're more than happy to welcome people in. Um, sort of February time, we will be looking to finish off the final fixes. Um, from our beta. Hopefully there won't be too many, but probably will. Um, and then make it public. Um, but that's not where it ends. So um, we have quite a good track record of continuously, continuously building and developing our own applications. Like I said, our version of Dorset Explorer has been running for like 15 years, continuously updated and improved. We're going to hopefully do the same with this. Even if not a single person looks at it ever, um, that's fine we're still going to keep building it and we're still going to keep building it open. There's no reason not to really. Um, has anyone ever heard the term eating your own dog food? Dog food, I've got a nod, so that's good. Anyone else? Maybe don't look it up before lunch, but look it up afterwards. Um, it basically means you use your own stuff. You tend to build it better. We use this stuff ourselves. So hopefully we'll build it better. What's the next one? That's the one I've got. We want to sort of briefly discuss, so we've discussed how we're using open source. We sort of touched on how we might want to build and contribute back code and projects. Um, but there's another sort of part to it. So we all kind of know and have discussed already how open source software can be quite unsustainable. You've got people volunteering huge amounts of their time 
for nothing, really. They don't necessarily get anything back apart from a warm feeling in their heart. Um, and you end up in this kind of issue where huge amounts of stuff is reliant on one little person's project somewhere who maybe doesn't get paid anything for it. So ideally, all of us, either as individuals or as companies, could actually give something back. Um, the, was it Tim who talked about money not being a dirty word? So a lot of these larger projects have ways of contributing via GitHub sponsors, Open Collective, some individual developers even have Patreons. Um, so that's a good way for us all to do it if we can. Unfortunately, um, local governments, as Paul mentioned earlier, we don't have huge amounts of money. And having to try and explain to finance that you want to give a grant to a project, but you're not getting anything from it. You're just kind of throwing money at them. As far as they know, you're not getting anything out of it. We all know we're getting something out of it. You can't really explain that to them. So it's very, very difficult. Not impossible, but very, very difficult. Um, what we can do, um, I, I use kind of a royal we here, anyone who can't do that, we can contribute that time and resources. So from a council perspective, we're targeting to actually have it written down that we can dedicate 50 to 100 hours of open source development every year. And that only really adds up to like a day a month. But if everyone was able to do that, we might get somewhere. Um, with pending approval from management from that one, but hopefully they'll have no problem with that. Um, we can also help with the hosting, running, and funding of events like this. So, yeah, Paul's been helping out to set this up, and I've given you some name badges. So <laughs> I've been very useful as well. <laughs> um, and the other thing, which Paul mentioned again a little bit briefly, is um, we can make use of support contracts. So, I said it's very hard for us to just give a grant to an open source project, but we can buy support contracts from companies that they themselves contribute either financially or via bug fixes etc so that's something we can do you know we get an obvious easy cost and the project gets fixes that's right. your one <laughs> that's me yeah you know when we practiced it that was exactly the same handover we did there so there you go that obviously shows practice doesn't make perfect so um you'll be pleased to hear this is the last sort of proper slide as well um so it's a good thing we planned it for 20 minutes yeah. but there we go lovely tech yeah. so just to summarize um hopefully you found the talk interesting and i know that you'll be really excited about lunch which i'm ex uh, i'm hoping is, is is currently wheeling its way to us outside got thumbs up yeah, we've got, so lunch is apparently appearing. Um, so just to summarize, really, we faced a number of challenges over the last couple of years. Again, all of you will have faced these things like remote working, um, trying to work with bugs and stuff. You always get that with any software. Um, I often say to people like, you know, because they say, oh, we've got this massive Microsoft contract. You know, what do we have with the open source? And I say, well, how many things do you report from Microsoft do they actually fix? And how many do they just put in a large queue and tell you to get behind seven other million other people that are saying it? So, you know, it's a common problem. Um, we've had some issues justifying our commercial support contracts, but actually for at least for a year or so managed to get one, which um, if you know local government is harder than it sounds. Um, and we've made some big leaps forwards um, in terms of getting our users to see the benefits of using open source um, and QGIS and various things like that. Again, as we said, with a mix of proprietary, not trying to get rid of it, just trying to make sure that people um, use the best tool that's right for them at a given time. And we're really, really looking forward to releasing GI Framework Maps as an open source application that people can have a look at. As Rob said, you might think it's rubbish, you might like it, you might not, but it's the right thing to do. We've developed it in-house as a council. And so what we want to do is just put that code out there in the open so that others can help us with it, use it, and hopefully it can become a sustainable uh, option that's available as a kind of .NET entry point into open source, um, you know, and We'll also point out we're still going to be using GeoServer, GeoNetwork. There's a lot of the uh, QGIS, a lot of the open source applications that you're familiar with. As I say, this is just one little part of that uh, open source picture. Um, so hopefully the future is still an open one for Dorset Council's GIS.